Florian Fiebeek is a research scientist at Nementa, recently graduated from the KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden, with a PhD in computational neuroscience. He's been sharing with us his work on Hebbian memory networks, which he describes in his PhD thesis linked in the show description. He's recently been featured in our research live streams talking about synapses and plasticity. You can find upcoming live streams featuring Florian by subscribing to the Nementa YouTube channel. His thesis not only provides new memory theory, but also provides a general introduction to memory and learning in Cortex. It is called Active Memory Processing on Multiple Time Scales in Simulated Cortical Networks with Hebbian Plasticity. I won't make you remember that. You can find a link for it in the show notes or you can download a PDF for free. Thanks for listening to the Nementa on Intelligence podcast, and I hope you enjoy this interview with a neuroscientist. Uh, first of all, welcome to Nementa. It's a pleasure having you Thank here. Thank you, Matt. It's a pleasure to uh, be here. I have been spending a good amount of time reading your PhD thesis and the three papers in the back. A lot of the things that have I'd like to ask you about come from this thesis. For those listening, it's called Active Memory Processing on Multiple Timescales in Simulated Cortical Networks with Hebbian Plasticity. That's a mouthful. <laughs> and we'll put a link in the show notes so you guys can, it's uh, freely accessible in yes. PDF format, which All is online. great because it's really good. Honestly, it's a great introduction to memory frameworks in general, I think, mm-hmm. in neuroscience, especially right. Hebbian memory, which talk about and uh, yeah I wrote soon. like in part it's a lot bigger than a dissertation it has to be just because I wanted my family and friends to be able to read some of it uh, <laughs> and not just my colleagues uh, so it was so, super uh, nice of you to do that because uh, <laughs> I mean it opens the doors for so many other people because I mean right. you go to I, I mean I'm not a neuroscientist right. I've been reading neuroscience papers for a few years now and some of them are just like immediately a brick wall right. that you can't get past because I gotta look up that I gotta look up that I Look at that. Well, the good thing is, just like just like Jeff, I've gone through this experience of sort of coming from a different field before, and then falling madly in love with neuroscience, and then you know, yeah. like squiggling your way into the into the field. And so I've had this experience for like one year, you know, dedicated trying to push into neuroscience and try to learn about neuroanatomy and electrophysiology and whatnot. Well, maybe you can talk about that. Your background and what led you to Dumenta now? Uh, yeah, uh, my background is I'm an engineer, so I. Started I studied at the Technical University Hamburg Harburg, uh, general engineering science, um, pretty much every branch of engineering there is, just because I couldn't get enough of it, so mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, process engineering, microcontroller ah. systems, you know. Uh, you yeah. migrated to the really big questions. Right? Uh, yeah, it was tough, you know, like I had a lot of side interests, I had a hard time making up my mind, so like, you know, patent law and like basic <laughs> economics and whatnot on the side. Wow. Uh, but so eventually I uh, got very interested in process optimization, uh, which also led me then into um, AI and robotics. And so I found this really cool master program in Stockholm, mm-hmm. which was quite modular. So it appealed to my uh, sense of never getting enough, being able to elect any courses that I would like because systems control and robotics, that's kind of everything. Yeah. Uh, and then I specialized in AI and machine learning and got increasingly frustrated with many of the... Um, a, li- a little bit with um, not the simplifications per se I like simplified models but the refusal to look at the brain for an inspiration mm. um, and so um, I, I was aware of Jeff Hawkins and his work for quite some time and so I eventually figured out if, if I'm going to do this which I'm going to have to do it myself Yeah. and so I sort of retrained myself like on the side in neuroscience and started sneaking into neuroscience <laughs> lectures and asking people people in the, in the back row for the password for the course web page. And, wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like, seriously, uh, anybody can learn anything if you really want to. It's, but, I mean, you're, you don't need anybody's permission no. to, to learn something. Right? And you, I mean, your doctorate's in neuroscience, right? Yeah, I mean, it's computational neuroscience, but of yeah. course that's a, that's a branch of neuroscience, yes. Right. Were you bestowed a sword when you were given your PhD? Because I heard in Finland, anyway, you get a yeah. sword when you become a doctor. Yeah, so uh, no, no sword. Uh, I got 
bunch of like you know heavy rocks of sorts, um, <laughs> like um, like, like artistic uh, things. One of them was actually very nice. It's like this inset stone into a glass sculpture of a head, so it looks like you're peering inside the brain. Ooh. <laughs> um, I forgot the name of the artist, but it's actually quite beautiful, and you get that nice. Dr. Student. I still should do uh, like a proper like ceremony, like the PhD, you know, graduation ceremony. There was one now that I missed, of course, because yeah. I went here. Mm. Uh, but you know they don't take that away from you. You can like go whenever and oh, get a good. ticket. And technically, my PhD is also a dual degree, so I get one from the University of Edinburgh as well. Huh. Uh, and then you get a kilt, so that's one more reason to show up in Edinburgh <laughs> to to give myself a proper kilt. Excellent. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, well, speaking of your your doctorate thesis, so I I haven't read all of this, but I read enough to think several times. This guy should be working for us. <laughs> like, like this is ex- I, I, so many times. I was like, that's exactly how we think the brain should should work. So I, I love that you're here, and and let's talk about some of this heavy and learning stuff. So mm-hmm. we're gonna get into some of the nitty gritty of neuroscience in this. This is yes, let's not a be podcast shy. about neuroscience. So let's so let's do this. Let's talk about heavy and learning. One of the things that the two factors in heavy and learning, right? right? There's, a, there's a learning rule that, that it requires a pre, why don't you talk about that first, because that, right. Uh, so, I mean, we can go back all the way to sort of this uh, simplified version of what Donald Hepp actually said, like, you know, that fire together, wire together. It's not what he actually wrote, but... Uh, <laughs> that's what everyone says. That's what everybody <laughs> says he wrote, right? <laughs> um, but the, the, the point is that um, fire together obviously means um, that you need to have some metric, some measurement by which you can observe whether they are actually active together. Mm. And so since there are two neurons, um, you always have what is called the pre-synapse and the post-synapse. So, um, and so you need to track activity on two sides of the equation. Mm-hmm. And then you also want to measure uh, how many times they're active together, right? So you want some, some um, so essentially, you have three measurements, right? Um, the, the, the presynaptic spiking, the postsynaptic spiking, and then what you're peculiarly interested in in heavy and learning is um, the, the correlation between the two. How closely together in time? Right, how closely in time and how closely together in intensity and like different learning rules capture different aspects of that. Right. Um, and of course, uh, it, it matters a lot because they, some uh, learning rules have very tight temporal kernels like S. Mm-hmm. Uh, spike time dependent plasticity kernels um, tend to be very narrow. So, like if the spikes on the pre and the postsynaptic uh, side don't occur within like you know 10, 20 milliseconds, then there won't be much of a synaptic change. Yeah. But many of the protocols we are using for inducing lasting associative change in neurons, where we you know bombard neurons with like long tetany of pulses. Uh, which are not necessarily biological, but very effective in potentiating synapses, making them strong. Right, right. during experimentation. During right. experimentation, right? Yeah. So like you have, uh, you have neurons that you've grown in a dish and there's a synapse between them and now mm-hmm. you want to investigate how that China synapse changes uh, with, with activity. Yeah. And so um, then we do protocols that are a lot better at capturing sort of rate relationships rather than the individual spike time. Right. right. So that's why it also matters to understand that there's so many different forms of plasticity that so that's work something, on different time scales. If you're thinking about a rate, you got to look at it over a time window. Right? Yeah, you're, uh, you're averaging. Uh, that can be like an exponential yeah. average or like some shifting time window. Mm-hmm. Or so there's a lot of ways you can apply heavy and learning. It sounds yes. like uh, you could do it one spike at a time right. and, and have a very simple rule, or you could have some oscillatory rule or right. something. Right, or it like might be depend on a triplet. You know, yeah, and like, yeah, lots of different ways. Yeah. Yeah, so um, there's so quite a, quite a zoo out there, and the, the interesting realization is, of course, it's it's not just a zoo in terms of mathematical models that mm-hmm. sort of abide by this broad idea of heavy learning that they're somehow capturing correlations, but there's also a zoo of biomolecular mechanisms that support that those yeah. uh, those ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, there's many forms of plasticity. Heavy learning is obviously just one of them. Uh, but there's several, you know, uh, possible mechanisms that could implement something like that in the brain. Is there, uh, does, does deep learning have anything similar to heavy in learning, like a two-factor rule like we're talking about at all? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, I mean, like, gradient descent per se doesn't really 
do that. You need um, some type of localized feedback, right? Yeah, because of course, I mean, that, 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 that is exactly right, right? I mean, a heavy and learning rule is a local rule because the, all the information that the signups has is only the information on the pre and the post signups. And right. we think of them as separate, but in fact, there's a lot of uh, messaging between them, not just the uh, you know, pre signups um, sort of releasing neurotransmitter that then gets detected and leads to a change on the other side, but there's also retrograde signaling and sort of there's a lot of communication, but it's all very local, right? It's a mm. small volume, so you don't get these big uh, full network kind of uh, analysis things. You can't reshape the whole network. You kind of need to right. do it from the smallest element up and see what emerges when you change the local rule. Right. So everything. Things locally learning simultaneously. Yeah, uh, that's sort of the emergent thing, right. and that's what makes it a little bit hard to wrap your head around because yeah. we are so used to designing systems top down yeah. rather than bottom up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's why also many of these things require you know, building things small and then it's testing how 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 they actually behave when they grow bigger because we might not be able to predict a priori. Sometimes with a very simple network like Hopfield Network, because you can predict these things, sure. like you you know what the distributions of weights, for example, are going to look like yeah. uh, certain conditions uh, right. and you know what kind of you know dynamical structures can get formed or not. But f as soon as you go have any amount of biological detail, you yeah. get so many non-linearities and, uh, uh, and you know so many differential equations yeah. <laughs> that interact with it with, uh, with another that uh, it gets impossible to predict much. So that's yeah. why all of my work is very heavy simulation science. Right, right. Now you hinted earlier that there were different types of plasticity mm -hmm. in Hebbian learning. Uh, there's a fast plasticity mm -hmm. and then there's a slower plasticity. Is that, is that synonymous with short-term plasticity and, and what you might call long-term yeah. Uh, potentiation, is it the right uh, word? Yeah, so uh, long-term potentiation is obviously a super important word in neuroscience, uh, often abbreviated LTP. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so because neuroscientists have been asking this question, what does it take to change a synapse? You know, in a lasting way, like yeah. you know, forever. How do we learn? Right. So How do we learn things? You know, that stick with us, right? Yeah. Not just to buffer the last three words that were just said. Right. Uh, but you know, how do I remember? You know, uh, the, the the name of my grandfather or something. Yeah. Um, and so, so, the, so it turns out there's some very good experimental um, sort of uh, findings, uh, protocols that are very nice in predicting how to potentiate synapses long term. The problem with many of those is that they require these, you know, long tetany, right? These long stimulus bursts mm. at rates that are just outrageous for uh, for a real brain. Right. Um, in part, they require that because these are cell cultures, so they're taken out of the sort of in vivo context right. and so they don't exactly behave like the real thing and also neuroscientists are impatient and they want reliable results <laughs> um, and so um, because of course in the real brain you know activity is a lot more messy and if there's any sort of burst activity it tends to be very short yeah um, and so as a consequence the, the most of the plasticity research early on was really just LTP research because it's relatively easy to do whereas these more fleeting forms of of short-term potentiation and there's a whole zoo of them mm -hmm. some of them Hebbian some of them non-Hebbian and in part my thesis makes the argument that particularly the Hebbian ones might be super useful for explaining things like working memory mm -hmm. um, and so it feels to me like a lot of the research is still you know reasonably new yeah. uh, because it's not really you use the term long term or short term, yeah. but the problem is that many of these uh, forms of plasticity are not really necessarily time dependent, they're more activity dependent. Right. Activity of the agent or activity of the cells around the... Yeah, of the, of the pre and the post synapse. Okay. So it turns out you can do get like a short term potentiation yeah. using very simple paradigms, but if there's any amount of ongoing activity, you know, just a couple of extra spikes, mm -hmm. that potentiation will very quickly go away. Hmm. Whereas if you then silence that cell culture, uh, you cut all the inputs, go away for six hours, mm -hmm. and then you come back and then you test just with a presynaptic ping, right? You just mm -hmm. send one spike through and detect what comes out on the other side. Yeah. The synapse is still strong. 
So it turns out short-term potentiation is not always short-term potentiation. Yeah. And in fact, the the term short-term is kind of misleading. What is Um, it then? What should it be? Yeah, I'm not sure yet, to be honest, Uh, because... There's something else besides time. Yeah, there's something else besides time. And we always model these dynamical systems with with sort of some tau time constant. So there's a lot of temporal uh, equations. Mm -hmm. And that's all right. I mean, if there's a certain level of noisy activity, then if there's activity dependent decay of some signal, then that will, you know, can get mapped onto time constant. Mm-hmm. But it kind of suggests that time itself is the driver for the for the you know for these signals. And it might actually not be. And so it's a little bit misleading yeah. to always start these discussions about potentiation by saying, oh short term, intermediate term, long term. Mm. Um, Interesting. Whereas in fact you know we might want to differentiate these. Maybe the context is not so much time but other biochemical that are involved in it or some other form of context around the memory system? Yeah, um, I mean, I gave um, two recent research talks now at Numenta about sort of fast forms of uh, plasticity, uh, which are not necessarily Hebbian, Mm -hmm. uh, called facilitation and augmentation. I remember those. And many of those are like reliant on calcium signals. Right. Um, And it turns out that, well, calcium diffuses relatively quickly and because of that, there's a certain time scale to this phenomena. Yeah. And there's there's ion pumps in the membranes that sort of restore the original oh, yeah. level of calcium. Right. And so that's why the signal will go away. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And so, at least in the sense that the calcium originally drove it, of course, these chemical cascades can get complicated. Right. So it's not really just, you know, calcium, but it's often sort of the initiating mechanism is often calcium. Mm. And so... So then you really want to understand it's not really time-dependent plasticity. It's more like calcium-dependent plasticity. Yeah, uh, but, I see. Yeah. Uh, That's more the context. Right, but who wants to talk but about usually it calcium things? is there because of some time, something about time. Yeah, about, uh, you know, like a number of spikes that got, yeah. you know, transmitted over a short time, and mm-hmm. so you had a lot of calcium influx. And uh, a lot of this is just um, tr- trying to maintain some homeostasis in the cell, or in or outside the cell, so there's biochemicals moving moving in and out just to get to a stable state, right? Right. Uh, homeostatic mechanisms are, are super important. Yeah. Uh, they keep the balance on many of these systems that otherwise would run away to weird indefensible states. Yeah. And I mean, very rarely do we get a glimpse into that, like in epilepsy, when you have runaway excitation and you right. have like, these waves of activity that just wash over the brain and activate every right. every neuron. Um, I often get asked by friends, uh, sort of, um, you know, what about this, you know, like how much of our brain is active and like this popular myth that we are only using <laughs> a little part of our brain right yeah. and then I tell them look I've, I've seen three times in my life I've seen people with 100% brain activity it's not pretty to look at I bet <laughs> um, right you have to be careful that these people don't swallow yeah. their tongue and, yeah it's um, not, not doing anything useful it seems yeah. you know I always think about this um, I used to <laughs> do you know what a bobcat is it's a it's a it's a small tractor uh-huh. right and it's got a scoop on it so it's sort of like they call it a backhoe or a loader Uh in in the midwest but the controls you sit in it it's just like one seat and it's like a small car right and it's got a loader in the front you usually just move dirt or drill holes with it or something for garden work or something yeah so you think why is he talking about this well okay so the controls on it are two sticks it's not a steering wheel there's like a stick in your right hand a stick in your left hand and if you want to move the right track you move the right one forward and you turn it's like a tank yeah so it's very much like a tank because you're on tracks or sometimes it's wheels but Mm -hmm. um, so there's a state you can get in very easily if you stop too abruptly both of the sticks go forward and then you go forward and move back and then you go forward and move back and forward and back and forward and back and the only way you can release from that is let go Right. right. Stop so, the feedback. Yeah, or else you you're just in the loop forever, right. and it's really, really off-putting. Oh, that's interesting. That's such a great example of like visually experiencing oh, yeah. self-feeding, yeah. like feed, auto feedback, right? Uh, it's, Definitely. It's, wow. <laughs> a bit like an epileptic seizure, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So you just get stuck in this uh, in this in this state, right? Yeah. Um, and all you can do is disengage. It's the only right. way to get out of it. Right. <laughs> and to, to cut the, the the. Yeah. And you only have to do that once, and you learn it. Because <laughs> right. it's such an easy way to get out of it, but you know, someone has to tell you, let go of the handles. Right. I remember that happening to me once. But. 
Anyway. <laughs> yeah, oscillations are a fascinating topic, actually. Let's talk about uh, working memory, mm -hmm. which uh, a lot of your thesis is about working memory, short-term memory versus long-term memory. So I found this fascinating because, you know, um, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about um, where pathways, what pathways, you know, the different streams. Mm -hmm. And uh, in your thesis, you talk about short-term memory mm -hmm. in, is it the medial prefrontal cortex? Uh, yeah. Somewhere yeah, around there? Typically, I mean, frontal cortex in general, mm -hmm. right, is, is involved in all these top down things, but particularly for um, sort of the kind of semantic declarative uh, working memory maintenance, mm -hmm. the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex has been uh, described to be important, but that maps onto, if you map that onto rodents that they don't have a dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, so right. then you talk about the medial prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. uh, so it sometimes gets a little bit tricky when you're pooling studies from different animals. Yeah, so. well, I mean, mice don't ever have to make shopping lists or yeah. do things like that, right? <laughs> Because that, that's what I always think about. I'm like, working memory. Mm -hmm. I liked your paper because um, I, I don't know how best to explain it, but you've got um, er areas where you say long-term memory, maybe two areas of the brain that are different sensory modalities, right, right. Uh, that are that are performing long-term memory. Mm -hmm. And your working memory is uh, in, in prefrontal. Uh, and that is sort of a scratch board or someplace that you can yeah. index. I like the word index there. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I go, this is what I do when I want to, see what I want to buy at the grocery store. I go to the refrigerator and I start looking for things and I'll look for something and that will trigger, oh, I, I also need milk in addition to eggs and coffee. Right. And that sort of thing. That associative yeah. nature of much of memory. Right. And, right. and so, so the, the long-term memory is getting sensory cues that identify objects, which then cues the short-term memory, right. Uh, right? Maybe right. you could explain this better. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we, we do this all the time. Right? Yeah. Like it turns out we have some of our working memory mechanisms are like really quite specialized for certain things. Like, so cognitive scientists have long described, for example, this, um, this auditory uh, phonetic loop, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. So this idea that you can even without much understanding you can loop a phonetic uh, sequence of some sort so um rather than thinking of these uh, five items that you want to buy and like visualizing them in front of your mind, yeah. you just speak the words, yeah. um, right? Or um, you build yourself, you know, like a little rhyme or something yeah, because sure. you're good at yeah. buffering things, right? Yeah. So buttermilk, egg toast, and uh, I don't know, cheese, buttermilk, egg toast, cheese, buttermilk, egg toast, cheese. Like yeah. I can repeat buttermilk, egg toast, cheese faster than I can even think of these concepts yeah, exactly. and what they would look like in the packaging on the shelf in the supermarket. Yes. <laughs> and so you can use that mechanism to sort of buffer that and then you have these indexes, butter, right, butter, which butter was it, that one, and then you recall what it looks like because you have a representation. The long-term memory is all there. You know what butter is, right? Yeah. Just like you just need a trigger for You it. just need a trigger, right? You need yeah. a retrieval mechanism. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes you can loop in these short-term systems that are specialized, um, you know, to very effectively get an index onto long-term memories. Yeah. Uh, and that is, of course, an associative thing because you're binding these things uh, together, right? It seems like an extremely useful place to construct plans and goals and, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, things that you want to do, projects that you want to create. I mean, that's what the prefrontal cortex is all about. Yeah, all the executive and the planning and the imagination. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's why these are all sort of like neighboring um, functions there. So, but uh, in long-term memory, we've got long-term potentiation, right? right? So a different type of learning. So in the short-term area, would you call that fast Hebbian learning, a, a, a different type of Yeah, that, learning? that's typically how you would prescribe it. it, it noteworthy, though, that that is a very new idea. Uh -huh. um, like the idea that um, long-term memory is associative has, has long been around, has been shown in these LTP experiments that, you know, you get binding of co-activated units, and if you anti-activate them in an anti-correlated way, they will actually uncouple so like the synaptic depotentiation or synaptic depression it's called mm -hmm. LTD instead of LTP uh, that has long been known but the idea for working memory was for, for a long long time that it would be some kind of persistent activity signal so rather than having a, a system that buffers these items in some um, 
synaptic changes, right? People would think there's some kind of reverberating activity mm. that self-perpetuates somehow. Mm -hmm. It mapped very nicely onto early models of neural networks, like these Hopfield networks, uh, which had these beautiful attractors, so they can, right. once you let them, once you kick them off, they can keep going for a while. The problem is just that you need dedicated attractors for all of these items, and you can think of a billion different things, and if you you get to the permutative complexity mm. of all of these things you can think of uh, and then it's very, cl qu very quickly becomes clear that you would much rather have a scratch board of some sort yeah. where it can you know put things down and then gets quickly gets erased right. so you don't have a dedicated network for all the working memory things you might want to keep short term on your mind yeah. even while you might have you know, lasting attractors for sort of principal things you've understood about the world. Right, right. Um, That's so interesting. I, I never, I've never thought about the prefrontal cortex as sort of being something that doesn't necessarily hold anything at the moment. Yeah. You know, it's just it's used for like a, a desktop. You know, to to put yeah. everything together. That's a fascinating thing. Like these structures are very multi-dimensional. Yeah. Um, and they're very like th these neurons might be doing one thing in one task and something completely different. In a dis different task yeah. um, and so that suggests um, that they're you know rather universal they get recruited into things yeah and a fast heavy mechanism would be one way to recruit them into some doing something useful for some time yeah but because it's a fast mechanism it also means they can be relatively quickly overwritten yeah but it might just be the temporal bridge that you need in order to kick off you know more lasting memory changes or to, just to perform the task right oftentimes we don't actually need the long-term memory we just need to be able to execute the task which means retrieving some long-term memory thing yeah. to be able to do it but yeah. then we can forget it so we don't actually want to consolidate the full thing right and you don't want to remember every word that i said today that's, right right that's, there's not, no point in it there's no we point forget in it. almost everything we ever yeah the vast majority right? i think of the brain as like this massive filter right so yeah. you have like all these impressions that you could perceive and a tiny percentage of that is even you know perceptible to the kinds of organs that we have yes we only see certain you know wavelengths and we only hear certain frequency bands okay mm -hmm. and then out of all the things that you could perceive only a tiny thing passed through your attentional gate so and so you're aware of even less than what you actually perceive yes right? i mean clearly there's like you know pressure in in my i don't know in my foot right now because it's inside a shoe but i don't perceive it right mm -hmm. unless i focus on it and then i notice yeah my foot has weight yes um <laughs> So, so you're not even aware of most of what you perceive. And then even less of the things that you actively perceive actually become short-term memory. So something that you are aware of for any amount of time, like some 10, 20 seconds. And, you know, so I might remember, you know, the last sentence that I just used. Mm -hmm. um, and so a tiny fraction of these things then become something that you might remember tomorrow. And of all the things you remember from yesterday, you know, you're going to forget most of it. It's very unlikely that, you know, much of that will be left after a decade from yeah. now, unless something extraordinary happened today. And right? it's not necessarily that you'll remember, I, mean, I hope I get these terms are right, the declarative experiences mm -hmm. that happened to cause your semantic models to update, right? You're just mm -hmm. going to remember the facts that got updated. In a lot of cases, right. it depends right. on the yeah. events so, that uh, uh, that happened. Yeah, I usually like to use this uh, example of like just try to remember. I don't know. Like you might know that the capital of France is Paris, but do you know who told you? <laughs> no, no, of course not. <laughs> so <laughs> one of the fascinating things we have this episodic memory where we you know remember the exact event and what happened, and this person walked in and said yeah. that. And, yeah. um, but we also have this you know much more semantic memory and sort of things that stick around and things we learn to sort of deconnect from the context mm -hmm. and in fact one of the most interesting discoveries that I made early on sort of that what I thought was super interesting about memory research was the fact that we have all these different systems and they don't seem to be connected very well mm -hmm. in the sense that you can have one but not the other like you can like knowing how to ride a unicycle right does not mean um, you know, might you, you might have a memory of when you learned how to ride the unicycle, mm. but actually they're completely different systems, and you can lose one without oh, yes. using the other. Yeah. Um, this is something they showed in HM. Yeah, right? patient HM, uh, this famous um, famous case where they could he train lost him. Campus. Yeah. They could teach him all kinds of interesting motor tasks, but he would never remember any any of it in 
the episodic sense. Right, right. right. But um, he would get better. Yeah, you could train him to be, you know, happy for something or, yeah. or uh, to be uh, afraid of something, right? Fear conditioning or could t- teach him certain motor tasks like, you know, writing backwards in a mirror, things like that, mm-hmm. right? That is a, it's hard to learn, but you can learn it. Um, but the interesting thing is, of course, he would get better like everybody else because he had these systems that are necessary for learning these things. But he did not have the hippocampus, which is, you know, this super important bridge into uh, long-term episodic uh, consolidation of memory. So you could leave the room, you know, come back two hours later, and you would not even know that he had done that task yeah. and actually improved his performance on it. Yeah, um, so. <laughs> that's fascinating. Mm. So we can get better at things without even realizing how we're getting better at them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and that also means that like, we need to get a little bit outside of like this story narrative we're always telling ourselves. We understand ourselves through what we remember episodically. Mm-hmm. But of course, our learning is much bigger than that. Um, that is particularly obvious to all the kinds of learning that requires uh, sleep and for all the kinds of memory learning that isn't declarative, so things you cannot state. Right. Uh, like motor like learning. Things you can do, you have to do right. to learn them, right? Exactly. Performances. Yeah, maybe we should have like explained the term, right? So there's the declarative memory, or memories that you can declare, so facts and events, so the semantic and what happened. Um, but then there's also all the non-declarative memories, which are, you know, motor skills and yeah. uh, and, and fear conditioning and um, like all, all kinds of uh, memories that you cannot state, but yeah. you can still learn and acquire, right? I mean, some of those are like motor things, like you can walk, right? But tell somebody how to walk. Yeah, it's tricky. You have to try. How do you? <laughs> how, how, can you tell somebody how to ride a bicycle, and then they will be able to do it? Uh, no, I don't think oh, so. Probably I mean, not, right? <laughs> they still need to practice. you got to do um, some trial and error. They right. don't know what it feels like to, to sit on a bicycle and to balance that, right. that thing. Um, yeah, that's... So that's, that's a fundamental distinction, right? And the, obviously these are then associated with different brain areas. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not that we don't use the other brain areas while we're learning those things. That we always use yeah. the whole of the brain, right? But, um, but those non-declarative... Uh, memories, I guess you could call them, are very personal. It's like, it's not, they're not facts and figures. They're tied directly to your body, your senses, and the things that you do with them. Which is why they don't transfer so well with words. Right, right. Whereas you can learn the capital of France, no problem, I can tell you. And then now you know this fact. Yeah. Uh, You mentioned this in your thesis, and I find it fascinating because I'm I'm a musician, and I like to perform and practice music. Mm -hmm. And you you noted that, like, a, a drum any drummer will tell you that um, the rhythms that they learn that day aren't really going to get locked in until they've had a good night's sleep yeah. and they come back the next day and then they'll pick it right up and yeah. that's absolutely true and I think any any uh, athlete or performance artist in any way it doesn't have to be cre- uh, creative but an uh, athlete the same thing you right. you have to have you have to have that practice that movement through space you know the yeah. update of all of your models and then get some rest come back try it again in a different context and then right. it sticks and, yeah, and one of the fascinating things that we can, of course, ask, and that I like did much in my earlier work, uh, is how do these transfer processes work, right? How, do, how does yeah. something go from this sort of initially acquired memory into something that is longer lasting? Mm-hmm. And so that's where all these interesting, particularly when it comes to uh, like spatial memory, um, um, but also uh, just you know episodic uh, memory in, in some sense, uh, there's this strong involvement of hippocampus, which we can read out in rodents very nicely right and um, you get all this interesting evidence of like this strong replay during sleep where whole episodes get compressed into like these short theta cycles like a hundred you know seconds sharp wave ripples Mm -hmm. so you get these fast oscillations riding on a slower wave and they compress the whole movement sequence of the rodent that you saw before you know like behaving you know for 20 seconds or something compress it down into this this very short burst with the exact same neurons activating in the exact same sequence but not just once or twice, hundreds of times. Wow, yeah. And that obviously got people thinking, is that causally related to the memory? And then people started meddling with it. So if you now yeah. suppress these, so you can have a microcontroller listening to those and then mm. targetly interrupt some of them, but not others. Um, what is it that um, that uh, tells your brain when you're asleep to take some events that happen during the day and reinforce them, but others don't worry so much about that? Yeah, 
yeah, that's <laughs> interesting, right? What what biases these uh, these yeah. effects? There must be some type of biochemical. Dopamine's probably involved. I mean, yeah, that's a big argument that uh, that modelers have have been making. I don't know how how exactly strong uh, this is, sort of in the interventionist sense, whether you can prove that yeah. by like intermittently, you know, blocking dopaminergic modulation of plasticity, for example. Yeah. Uh, but that it's true that like the presence of dopamine at like these synapses can um, can make the uh, synapses a lot more plastic, meaning yeah. they are stronger. And the hypothesis that at least my first paper makes is that these stronger synapses will then uh, be much more capable of reactivation, and because mm. they reactivate, they get stronger. Right. So there's a, like this, this self perpetuating dynamic. Yeah. They the stand most, out sort of from the rest yeah. of. Uh, so the most powerful memories yeah. kind of run away. Yeah. And so in that sense, the really question is, well, if you want to remember something, there's really two, two, two plans, right? Uh-huh. Um, plan A is uh, just repeat it a lot, right? Make it sort of strong by repetition, repetition. That's why you practice your, you know, vocabulary, not just once or twice. You go through your cards, you know, 50 yeah. times. And that increases the odds that yeah. they will get consolidated, right? Because it doesn't matter that you know now. What matters is that you know, you know, yeah. two weeks. Now I like to change my test. context, go outside and do something, go over here and study the same thing. Right. <laughs> and then there's, of course, the, the, the other strategy where instead of doing massive amounts of repetitions, you make it really, really relevant. Mm, right, right, right. right. Um, I don't know. You could have, like, outrageous example, right? You slap somebody in the face and tell tell that person <laughs> your name. They will never forget your name. <laughs> That's right? true. That's uh, a good so, tactic to use. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, I don't recommend that. I'm not a believer in violence. I'm very kind. <laughs> but the point is we are very good at recognizing what is relevant and when when something is relevant to us, much of that is obviously biologically pre- pre-coded, right? So we value pleasure and pain and, yeah. uh, you know, anything with sex, you know, is a lot better remembered. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's just true, right? I anything that it. has social relevance, so yeah. there's stories involved and people. That's why all these memory artists, they map all their tasks always onto, you know, locations people, places, or, yeah. locations, you know, things that we are, like, automatically good at because we have dedicated circuits for that and mm-hmm. things that mean something to us. Mm-hmm. They create like palace of the mind. You want to make these objects that you're putting in the space like outrageous, you know, like yeah. the, you don't just want the chair in the corner, but no, 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 the, the chair is like, you know, fiery red and like, I don't know, its leg is on fire. Yeah. It's like, well, now you're not going to forget that chair. Yeah. It's a weird picture in front of your mind, but if that helps you build that palace of your mind for your memory task, yeah. that, that is in fact what they do. The more outrageous the story, the better our memory is. Yeah. And I mean, there's there's a reason for any performance artist or athlete that when they perform something well, it feels really good, right? Mm-hmm. When, because you get immediate feedback from right. that performance. You're, you're paying attention to the music you're playing or the ball that you're hitting or, or whatever. And when everything works, it's a great feeling, right? Yeah, flow states are a beautiful thing. They are beautiful right. things, yeah. yeah. Serendipity. Um, let's talk about attractors for a little bit. And, right. Um, attractors are tricky to describe. So not coming from a mathematics background, it was very hard for me to understand what an attractor even is or what a dynamical system even is. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you can help explain that or not, because it's a hard thing to explain. I, you can I think I can. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I mean, put like, you know, highly simplified, right? An attractor is quite simply, if you have a, um, a system with a lot of elements, um, there's obviously the, the space in which that system can be in terms of all the combinatorics, right? All the different elements can be in a, you know, t- a combined span a wide space of what the configuration at any Did you call it a high dimensional space? Yeah, so it's like a, like a high dimensional space, right? Yeah. You have like, I don't know, let's say like 100 units and they can be on or off. It's a very big space yeah. right, in terms of what could be represented. Right. Um, but the interesting thing is when you build, put some structure into this, uh, when you connect these nodes and you associate some things, then you can have substructures within that. And more than that is that the when you have sort of some number of connected nodes, mm-hmm. let's call them, right, for simplicity's sake, um, then when you activate just some of them, they might recruit the rest of that, what we call an ensemble. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So sometimes these terms are used interchangeably, like, uh, you know, like, the, like a tractor or cell ensemble mm-hmm. or... Um, 
Oh, there's a couple more terms uh, that escape me now. But the, the point is quite simply sort of the, the first main important um, characteristic of, of any attractor is that they can do things like pattern completion. Mm. So whenever you get close to the state that is encoded in an attractor, mm. that is that particular configuration of activation, then the network's activity will be attracted to that configuration, right. meaning it's going to change through the interactions of the elements into a configuration that is that attractor state. Right. The cool thing about that is that you can have many of those. In a big network, you can embed tens, hundreds, thousands of attractors, and they rely on connections between your nodes. Right. These nodes in the brain would be neurons, Right. so you would get some kind of a population code mm -hmm. where different configurations configurations of active neurons together represent something. And then if you activate just a tiny piece or you get close in, in the activity space to one of the encoded attractors, mm -hmm. then the network would fall into those attractors. Right, right. right. So you would and then as a memory researcher to us that is, well, I give you a cue and you retrieve the memory. Right. That's why attractors are useful memory models so because they're... You feel embedded. something fuzzy, perhaps, mm -hmm. and you match to fuzzy objects you've touched or something like that? Something like that, yeah. yeah. So um, that already gets a little bit complicated because, of course, when there's many fuzzy objects, that might mean at any given point you might fall into different attractors. Right. And then it becomes relevant, well, what biasing elements do you have? Mm. Right. So maybe you also, you know, see a certain color or a certain shape or yeah. something. Context and matters. Context yeah. matters then. And then that biases the evolution of the network when all these units activate and inactivate each other through their interactions mm -hmm. into a certain direction, right? Um, the little weird thing about sort of like these dynamical attractors is that they don't just fall into a place like the, the simplest forms of attractor networks, like so called hop field networks, right? Yeah. They have a number of embedded attractors, and as soon as they enter that attractor, the network is stable there. Yeah. So it will not change over time. Right. In neural networks and in the kinds of um, biophysically detailed spiking neural networks that I have built, um, attractors dynamically destabilize. That does not mean that the attractor is deleted from the memory. Mm -hmm. It's still in the network, in the lasting connections. But neurons will, will tire, they will wear out. Right? There's a thing called neural adaptation. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the signaling chemicals that are available for immediate transmission will, will deplete. That's called synaptic depression. Mm -hmm. And so you can use those two elements to build a system that can fall into an attractor, yeah. activate it for a while, and then automatically be pushed out of it because the resources that are necessary for maintaining that item in activity uh, get depleted, yeah. which then means the network is free again to yeah. wander around and find some other attractor. Does that relate to short-term memory at all, like holding things in your mind and if you don't think about them while, well, they just go away? Uh, yes, no. So, uh, so the idea is there's only one thing on your mind at any given moment in time. You yeah. can jump between different things, yeah. but there's always sort of a foreground of activity, right? which we obviously relate to from the conscious experience of always attending to something Yes, that can be external, right? But it can also be internal when you're thinking of your own memories and what you might want to think of. Right. And so it turns out that even though the brain is like this massively parallel system with all these neurons that are active at any given time, yeah. You are still playing it like a, like a keyboard, so there's a, a, only one you know configuration active at any given point in time, even though it's capable of many different ones. Mm -hmm. And some of them are built to transition, like when you're learning sequences. Yeah. One series of three tones activates the next, activates the next, activates the next. So sequence memory, right? The thing that the HDM uh, neural model at Numata really excels at. Yeah. Um, these these kinds of memories are also a form of attractor because the activity is pulled forward into right, something. Right, right. It plays, it's just, plays out. Right. It's just that that attractor is not one fixed point because yeah. that point immediately evolves into something else. Yeah. But it's it's initiated by, well, it does, not always, but potentially initiated by sensory input mm -hmm. to, to, to roll through one of these attractor sequences. Right. And then you're constantly comparing sensory input to the sequence if you're playing a song or, or just 
singing right. along with something right. and or it's whatever. involuntary, right? Yeah, so the yeah. system does that by itself. So like there's constantly attractors going on in your head from one right. thing to the next, and those right. could represent any number of things. Right. right. So that's like essentially called the, the cortical attractor theory of, mm -hmm. of neocortex or of neocortical memory. The idea being that you have these distributed representations of specific brain states that actually get encoded, right? So there's strong connections between them. Right. And they are competing for activation at any given moment in time. Some of them are associated with one another, so they can yeah. activate each other, yeah. you know, forward or backward. Um, and one of the nice ways to embed these memories into a system like that is to use heavy learning rules, right? Mm. Or in my case, a specific Bayesian um, uh, derived, uh, Bayesian statistics derived heavy learning rule. So, mm. which is in some sense optimal because you're not just computing correlation between two units, but you're also normalizing that by the by the priors of the pre and the postsynaptic neuron, which is bit of technical detail, I guess, but for those interested in Bayesian models, that might be interesting. Interesting, yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about the binding problem. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, when I was reading your th third paper in your thesis about the short-term memory versus long-term memory areas, um, how, what, what is this binding problem? It's a big thing in neuroscience, and, right. and how, how, do, how do you think it should be addressed? Right. Um, so there, there's a lot of in the, the, the one of the problems of uh, of my work, right, and the the, the field that I work in. That it's um, that it's very. Um, it's very interdisciplinary, right? So there's ideas from cognitive science, mm -hmm. where the binding problem comes from, which I'll get to in a second. There's obviously a neuroscientific evidence on all kinds of things and details that constrain models when you build them in detailed ways. And then there's the whole computational side, how do you build these systems and neural network simulators and how do you put these things together? Yeah. And as a consequence, my work tries to speak to all of these different groups. Right? I want to build systems that are reasonably defensible, mm -hmm. but that also do something useful computationally, um, and that also you know sort of demonstrate what we can do in terms of a brain simulation. Yeah. But also do something cognitively interesting. So it has, has some utility. Right. And so the 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 one of the kinds of uh, of the binding problems is this uh, what's called role filling. So I, I think a, a useless example in, in that paper of um, telling you that the, 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 the name of my parrot may be Charlie, right? Mm -hmm. And so you know Charlie normally as a name of somebody, right? You might have a friend called Charlie. Yeah, it's just a label. Right, but if I now tell you, right, after telling you that the name of my parrot is Charlie, you won't be, like, you can tell me, like, you won't be surprised if I tell you that, you know, Charlie can fly. Uh, and you, right, know, right. you might even be able to tell me now that Charlie can probably speak. Um, because you've now connected these elements. Yeah. And the interesting thing is you don't have a long-term memory representation of that. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. you literally just learned that and the kinds of long-term memory that we're talking about with the LTP, mm -hmm. that takes at the very least hours right. Right, to express. Um, so you cannot have a, a, a brain structure that represents a flying parrot called Charlie. Right. But you're still capable of making that association very quickly. Yeah, right away. Right? I can think about it for right. Right. minutes. <laughs> right, exactly. So like, um, you, you know, you do these memory tasks, right? You, people just, you flash them a, a card for like a fraction of a second and they yeah. can tell what card did you just see. Well, it's an ace of spades. Okay, cool. Um, so it turns out that associative binding can be very quick. And then you really have to ask, where does that binding take place? And one of the ways that people used to think about that in terms of persistent activity is that all of these things get activated together. So the name Charlie, right, with or without your friend that has that name, and the idea yeah, of that could a, of be a perhaps in a language area. Right, you know, exactly. That, that they would somehow be all active together. Yeah, yeah. The problem with that is that um, that is nice if it's one memory or two, but if you are now doing a working memory task hmm. and you're holding on to other things like we are talking about all kinds of concepts here and you still yeah. know that the name of my parrot is Charlie right yeah um, and so 
um, somehow we must be able to buffer these things even when the activity for them becomes undetectable. There's all these wonderful studies about activity, silent working memory yeah. uh, that have come out in, in recent years um, of people who've been looking fancy for the signatures and finding them so you can read out the content of the working memory. But there's the substantial period when you distract people or when people have to shift their attention to multiple items they have to hold on to, mm-hmm. where the entire activity signature of that working memory item gets lost. You can no longer detect it. Yeah. Yet, as soon as you provide a clue, it's back again. Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Right. As a software engineer, yeah. I know what it's like to be deep in a coding project mm-hmm. and get interrupted and come back and have no idea what I was doing. Right. But then as soon as I find that nugget, I'm like, oh, that that's closet, okay. Right. And I'll get right back where I was. Right. It's like your short-term memory is pulling everything yes. from long-term memory and then... Right, and, and, and putting it together. Yeah. Again, right? yeah. And so the, so the answer clearly must be, at least in my understanding of it, that if the, if the encoding is not in the activity space, even though it's often visible in the recordable activity of neurons, right? Yeah. That if it's going to be silent for some while, the information must go somewhere. Yeah. And the only place in the brain where information can go that is not sort of active, you know, in the neural activity, well, it's in the changes in the in between the neurons, the synapses. Yeah. So there must be very fast, right? Because again, I flash your card, put it down, and you already know what it was. Yeah. Right? There must be very fast buffers that might be activity dependent and reasonably fast non-activity dependent synaptic changes Mm. and if they are going to be associative they're likely heavy in some form and the cool thing about those very fast forms of heavy plasticity as a mechanism to solve this binding problems to put things together is that you don't have to encode the full context you already know what a parrot is you already are familiar that Charlie is a name it's not some weird phonetic sequence Right. But you need a long connection, right? For somehow mm-hmm. from the short term memory area. To yeah, the problem is that they, these representations might be far apart. Right, right, right. They might not just be neighboring assemblies that now can immediately yeah. click together. You've got a sound of a parrot in the auditory area. Right. Versus the visions of parrots. Are exactly. You somehow need to put them together. Yeah. And the brain can build, you know, like these powerful associations across neocortex. But again, if it's long term structures, like mm-hmm. Long-term memory. That's going to take time, and if we buy the story of long-term memory consolidation during deep sleep in the hippocampus, that mm-hmm. might take hundreds of reactivations during deep sleep. So yeah. you need some other mechanisms while you're awake and behaving to do to solve this binding problem. Yeah. And so the the solution that that we've come up with is this idea that prefrontal cortex does not actually hold the full content of working memory. Mm-hmm. All that it needs to do is to hold a temporary short-term index with which those things can be linked. And I've shown in my work that the connectivity that is required for that can actually be very low. You don't need a lot of synapses. Yeah. Um, particular when the items that you want to bind together are very strongly encoded. Yeah. So you already know that geometric shape and you already know that, you know, phonetic, that, that word or that yeah. sound, right? So these are very strong assemblies that will self-complete if you give them a tiny piece of it. So you don't need much information to, exactly. to link two things but you together. Need a, but you need a directed bias that yeah. makes sure that when you now see the shape or okay. the phoneme or whatever, you know, things you're associating, yeah. you are capable of bridging, right? And yeah, there's yeah. only a few brain areas that are situated in a way that they could do that. So let me restate this and just make sure I uh, understand it properly. In, in the short-term memory area of the prefrontal cortex, all you really need to create an associative, associative links between objects when you're putting together working memory is just enough to kickstart the attractors. Right. right? So just a, just a nugget of it so that yeah. the attractor can be invoked in whatever other parts of the brain and then an association between those nuggets. Right. Yeah. So they become come active together. Right, right. right. And then if, and if in long-term memory, if right. you have a sensory input that comes through sensory cortex, mm-hmm. that can 
trigger your short-term memory to invoke the whole association. Right. right. So I do this e example, right, where I have a, have a very brief cue which activates one long-term memory representation through sort of sensory input. Then that thing is, has, activates an index and prefrontal cortex and retrieves an associated long-term memory in a brain area that might not, you know, might be far away. Yeah. Like we're talking centimeters away here, right? So where there's very unlikely to be direct connections right. between the things you're wanting to associate. But we know that the working memory is reasonably universal. You can, of all the things you can have in long-term memory, you can associate almost anything. Yeah. Um, so since there can't be a dedicated population for any conjunction of things you might be able to come up with because the permutative complexity is too high, mm -hmm. um, you need a flexible system. Right? And so a fast Hebbian mechanism might do just that. Luckily enough for us, there's some early findings of such mechanisms. Again, they're hard to observe because they're so fleeting, mm -hmm. particularly many of the old experimental paradigms uh, that like try to measure synaptic plasticity all the time by pinging the synapse. They might actually delete that encoded state very quickly so that you might be blind to the to the observation you want to make because you're essentially by looking you are deleting it it's a little bit like the like the example of Schrodinger's cat right right um, like the cat is alive and a dead yeah. and dead at the same time but you can't look uh, <laughs> as soon as you look it's either one or the other yeah yes yeah, yeah. I, it, short term plasticity is a little bit like that right, right? because if right. you want to observe it if you test the synapse a lot by a lot of pings mm -hmm. to see what its strength is, then you're eroding whatever you know its encoded state was. Interesting. So silence is like uh -huh. you know the, the way that working memory might get preserved, not activity. Interesting. Well, I think uh, if anybody wants to know more about any of this stuff, uh, your your thesis is a great place to start. Once again, active memory processing on multiple time scales and simulated cortical networks with heavy and plasticity. Maybe there's an acronym we can make out of that. <laughs> yeah, uh, people are fighting over the nomenclature for this, right? So yeah. what is STP, short-term plasticity? Mm. And then some people are now arguing, well, you know, it, it, it might be STSP um, <laughs> because you want to differentiate, you know, different subclasses of that. And then some people call it labile long-term potentiation mm. because it's lasting, but it's fragile. Yeah. Uh, so there's a, a zoo of new terms um, and it's a little bit like the nomenclature on inhibitory neurons it's like a zoo and there's lots of different <laughs> classification schemes and uh, right. we're just waiting for neuroscientists to agree on something but we're not letting that stop us we're building models Great. anyways um, well you're operating on uh, essentially the frontiers of science here so you're going to have that problem for sure <laughs> <laughs> right but that also makes it exciting right I get yes. to read a lot of what is happening in experimental neuroscience and always of course hunting for what is the consensus what is what are the mechanisms that might be useful mm -hmm. right uh, what are the missing pieces and that, that makes it very exciting uh, day to day yeah absolutely uh, well Florian it was a pleasure uh, I should should remind watchers or uh, listeners that if you want to hear more from Florian, you can go to our YouTube channel, the Nementa YouTube channel, where we have live research meetings. Florian's given a couple of those recently, as he mentioned earlier, and uh, there'll probably be more. I'm there'll sure probably there will be more, yeah. Yeah, so uh, you can get more of Florian there. Um, thanks again. Fist bump. That's what we're doing. A pleasure, man. <laughs> All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to the Nementa on Intelligence podcast. I am Matt Taylor from Nementa. You can get more at our YouTube channel. Just search YouTube for Nementa. And also follow us on Twitter at Nementa, N-U-M-E-N-T-A. Have a great day.